All right. Uh, call to order the January 18th, 2022 Economic Development and Airport Committee meeting. Uh, tonight's uh, attendance, uh, Mr. Richard, Dr. Fellner, and myself. Um, we're looking back at November 16th, 2021 meetings. I'm sure we've had an opportunity to review those. Can I have a motion to approve those minutes? I'll make that motion to approve the minutes. And I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passage unanimously. Um, tonight's agenda has several uh, topics of discussion. And before we approve the agenda, I'd like to make a motion to remove items C and D off of tonight's agenda to amend that agenda. I'll make yeah, but I don't, do we need to make a motion to no. go out of order with that? All of the, all of the, okay. All of the, at the same and to uh, move item G, the Avita Foundation request, up to item A, which would be the first topic of discussion. Can I have a motion for that? I'd like to make a motion to uh, remove the free center discussion, the US 3061 discussion, and to move uh, item G, Avita Foundation request. Uh, to the first item on the agenda. For I'll second tonight. that motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Can I have a motion to approve tonight's agenda then? I'd like to make a motion to approve the amended agenda. And I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Well, that was a little smoother than my last one in December. I'm getting the hang of this one. All right. Uh, tonight we have a guest. I'm um, sorry, sir. I did not catch your name. Chuck Angelosi from the Avita Health Foundation. All right. And you wanted to discuss a potential resolution that's before us tonight um, regarding some grant money to be allocated towards the dialysis center? Yes. Well, please feel free. The floor is yours. Yep. Um, again, I know there was some discussion uh, maybe back in October, November. Hi, Dr. Feldman. How are you? Good. Good. Thank you. And, uh, you know, just over the 18 months, last two years, Avita, has, the health system has learned an awful lot about itself in regard to patient care. And so um, take a step back and uh, uh, tell you how the foundation helps the hospital relative to patient care. So we're a pass-through foundation. We're not, like the, we're not like the community foundation for Crawford County. We're not like the Richland uh, County Foundation, although we receive funds and we're a pass-through. So we take in dollars, we pass them through to the hospital. We meet with leadership before the start of the fiscal year, and we just determine in order for the hospital to meet its financial goals, where, where can they use help? Um, with programming, with uh, capital improvements, uh, um, vision planning, what strategic planning, whatnot. So in our goals last year, uh, the medical staff brought forward uh, some important clinical uh, advances or enhancements that they thought they needed. One of them was inpatient dialysis. So as you know, uh, as I had discussed with the mayor back in uh, back in October, or maybe it was even September. I mean, the hospital has great working relationships uh, with two with two vendors, you know, local vendors, and uh, you know we have over a thousand uh, dialysis patients, you know, that uh, we collaborate back and forth on. Unfortunately, in these COVID times, many of those patients has, had ha, have ended up uh, being admitted to Galleon or Bucyrus or Ontario Hospital um, for, having, uh, for having COVID, exasperating other symptoms. But these are people who in the hospital required dialysis. And as in any uh, business and industry, uh, whether local, uh, across the state or across the country, everybody is having staffing shortages, everybody is having supply chain court shortages, and that is no different than um, you know, um, uh, what transpired, what has been transpiring with, with, uh, with our vendors and dialysis as well. And so uh, we tr we're, we're not, doing, we're not uh, uh, discontinuing any relationship with our vendors, but the plan at the hospital is to make sure that um, we can offer dialysis when a physician indicates or, or you know, makes it part of the daily, weekly plan of care that we can deliver that dialysis. And uh, I would just uh, say that, um, you know, it's been quite challenging over the course of the last 18 months, you know, again, to deliver that kind of care within the hospital. So again, our vendors in each of the hospitals, uh, we do have a, a room that has two portable dialysis machines. They exist, uh, they exist uh, or have existed in uh, Ontario, uh, one dialysis machine in Galleon and one uh, dialysis machine in, in um, Bucyrus. And so 
Uh, we feel like, uh, you know, uh, COVID isn't going anywhere for a while. Um, and uh, that, you know, we need to, um, you know, um, enhance that service in each one of our hospitals by acquiring uh, additional dialysis machines and training uh, nurses um, and tech staff to be able to deliver uh, that dialysis care. You know, making sure that our labor pool um, is ready to go at any, our duck chart, so to speak, is ready to go at any given moment. Our duck chart uh, has been pretty weak uh, in the area of dialysis over the last, you know, over the last 18 months. And um, Justin Gallion alone, I think I, I'm sorry to bring a presentation with me and, uh, um, you know, just our doctors are so overwhelmed. Uh, I have not sat down with our chief nephrologist in over a month, um, but we had well over 120 dialysis patients, you know, uh, you know, in our county and around 80 of seeking and just in this last year inpatient dialysis that was challenging in Gallion Hospital again, through all those different staffing and whatnot uh, reasons, you know, that I presented with and I talked about before. Um, so, again, the challenge for the foundation is to go out and seek, uh, you know, funding, grant-making, philanthropy, wherever we can to fund these kinds of things. Uh, we've had great success in Ontario, uh, funding uh, three machines in Ontario and uh, funding our machines in Bucyrus. And, uh, you know, I was, again, uh, Wanted to reach out to uh, to council uh, once again to Mayor O'Leary, who has been extremely supportive of the hospital and the foundation. Uh, you know, since I arrived a couple of years ago, it's been great, and uh, you know, wanted to see if we could get help for uh, the machines that uh, you know we want to add here in Ga in Galleon. And uh, each machine, um, I think you may have uh, maybe saw uh, the uh, next stage pricing that we got maybe at your October meeting. Each machine is about 23,000, the portable machines, plus the software about 3,000, so we're asking for uh, 26,000. Um, we did make the request for the second machine for Galleon from the Hessenhauer, Hessenhauer Fund, so we feel like we're confident that, um, you know, we have uh, two uh, organizations that would consider helping us move forward and uh, should, um, you know, should that be something that you'll help us out with then on the equipment side, we'd be in good shape. On the training side, again, we've identified, you know, some people are going to make some extra money, mm -hmm. uh, you know, getting trained and being able to be added to the labor pool depth chart uh, for dialysis purposes. So we do have a, we do have a good pool of people interested in, in uh, getting more training. The hospital, again, when we put the budget together for this, you might have seen that. The hospital is, you know, covering the portion of, Obviously, uh, the cost of training and the um, obviously through increased revenue through more dialysis, you know, certainly going to be able to cover the um, you know the extra uh, stipends and salary that'll go out to uh, pre predominantly nurses, but some techs that will be trained to deliver the dialysis, inpatient dialysis as well. Uh, hope that was enough information. Be glad to answer any questions that sure, you have. You, this is more of a comment or well, a question. You, you know, the census in your, the hospitals has just been overloaded. I mean, the ICU is full of, of COVID patients. Yes. And so, right now, your ability to deliver inpatient dialysis is, in Gallon it sounds like it's a struggle. It, 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 yes, uh, is, to say the least. It, it's a struggle. Yeah. So every day we're just coordinating with our local vendors, uh, you know, just seeing how the staffing is working, okay. you know, how that's all, you know, when we could deliver, and that, that's what we're working on right now. Right. Or we work on every most days. Sure. Who's the local vendor? We we use obviously the Vita and Fresenius, but uh, you know, those those are our vendors that we contract with. And how many patients? So the the, the um, our our kidney patients uh, that have a primary care physician with a, a Vita that uh, we refer to one of the vendors. We have well over a thousand patients, um, you know, with that that have a primary care provider that you know we we coordinate that care with. And obviously, that outpatient coordination of care is something that's really critical. And you know, 
Um, we need our vendors to stay as, as strong as we want to be and impatient, right, uh, through all of this. Um, and then, uh, again, uh, just in my last count over a month ago in talking with Dr. Liu, you know, we had about 130 unique patients that uh, required um, inpatient dialysis, and I'm sure maybe, maybe you have family members or not, but that's not a that's not a one and done uh, kind of a kind of a therapy or a treatment. So when you start stacking in, you know, those admits on top of one another, you know, that need where critical access 25 beds in Galleon and Bucyrus, so you have three or four patients at a time uh, that need, uh, you know, renal therapy. Uh, you're talking about, you know, a lot of hours, a lot of man hours for those that seek the care, some, some three, some four, some five times a day. And what you want to get away from is, you know, for a patient that has to have, or the, you know, the physician wants, uh, you know, the, um, the, um, the care delivered, let's say, on a, um, you know, a, a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and we can't, we don't have the staffing to do the Thursday, so uh, we try to get two hours in on a, on a Friday so we could lead in blood's healthy enough to lead into, you know, those are, again, those are things that we want to avoid. They're, you know, they put patients at risk, and of those patients that I described, it's a pretty high mortality rate, pretty high. Was the um, <coughs> so you do have some units now? We, we do. We I, have. I just want to make sure if we do this, that yeah. you know we're going to have enough for yeah. what you are so we're, we're, talking about. So we we will have um, we will have two if uh, Fresenius uh, you know keeps again. Everyone's having supply issues, mm -hmm. right? Everyone. Uh, you know, these machines need servicing, right? It's not as if, you know, we just use them patient after patient, right? And uh, so, um, again, I'm not the clinical expert. I'm not in our bioengineering department that looks at these machines every day. But there could be a chance that when we get two brand new ones, uh, Fresenius and DeVita might say, gosh, we get... We need a backup machine at our place. So I don't know what that looks like, quite honestly. But, uh, you know, we do know that, um, you know, the machines are needed. And uh, our goal is two Bucyrus, two Galleon, and uh, make sure we have three in um, Ontario. Now this would be for Galleon, correct? We're, we're looking out. Again, we have, we've done great. Uh, we have support from, um, you know, in Bucyrus. We have support in Ontario, um, and again, I was doing this, uh, started to talk about this back in October when, we, when right. it first came and presented, and um, so I was looking for funding sources, Galleon specific, again, listen, uh, again, the mayor, funding sources, I mean, everyone's been, uh, everyone's been terrific, uh, this community's been terrific, you know, just in the county, Richland, uh, Crawford County alone, our, our little foundation, uh, dispersed a million dollars in cash to the hospital system last year. We'll disperse another million dollars this year, um, provided that we hit all our goals. So uh, everyone's been super generous and supportive of the hospital. Uh, I'm an outsider, as we were discussing you know, earlier. Hope to be an insider uh, sometime in the future, you know, but an outsider with family down here. And, you know, these little communities are little gems. And, and uh, again, as an outsider, I feel like the hospital is working really hard on behalf, just as every area of business and industry is working hard on behalf of the people in the community. Uh, our people, I feel, are working especially hard, and and, uh, and I know our medical staff would not have come to us, uh, or we wouldn't have been discussing this issue unless they thought it was pretty critical in nature. Um, how much, uh, do you have any idea how much COVID money the Abita Health Systems have received from the federal government since the outbreak of COVID? Well, and the, if you do know, how much of that went, has went towards the project that you're approaching? None about? of that None of that money would have gone towards the project itself. Again, as I, I mentioned earlier, how we come up with our plan yeah. for who's going to raise or who's going to work on what. Mm -hmm. You know, we, again, we decide that, you know, pre in advance of the fiscal year in order for the hospital to reach its goals that, you know, the board of directors, you know, presents, you know, we look at all the different models mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, from a capital and from a programmatic standpoint, those new or those enhanced pieces are put, mm -hmm. uh, put up on the board. We talk about them. We talk about 
um, you know, what opportunities might exist out in the out in the community, in the grant world, in the philanthropy world, you know, to help move some of those projects forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, so we divvy it up that way. So the hospital hasn't put any CARES Act money. I I can't speak to the amount of money that the federal government has reimbursed for Medicaid or Medicare sure. or any of that. I can't speak to that. Uh, we're kind of two separate entities a little bit. Um, but um, what I can tell you is. Uh, we've been successful in our other sources besides seeking grants from mostly grant makers as we have, uh, you know, since I arrived and, you know, we've, uh, we've moved a little bit more in the grateful patient area. So over the last, uh, uh, well, since we started, maybe we made our first ask maybe in September, mm -hmm. um, we've raised about mm, maybe 24, 25,000 so far, south of 25,000 mm -hmm. just from patients who have gone through uh, or, or members of, or families that have had loved ones go through dialysis program who, who have been transplanted uh, from our partners down in Columbus who come back and see their, you know, um, get their care from their primary care physician. Um, and so we've, we've, so those are the sources that we've been looking at, the foundation from a philanthropic and a grant making, um, you know, perspective. Have you had an opportunity to approach any other uh, cities about the same opportunity, whether it be Bucyrus, Ontario, and have those councils uh, agreed to? Oh, I haven't, gone, we haven't, I haven't been to the city councils yet. I was, uh, um, again, uh, I started this quest back in uh, mm -hmm. October when I met with uh, the mayor earlier for the first time, and then and just through a series of circumstances, it just got us away. But we were successful with funding right off the bat in uh, Bucyrus, mm -hmm. uh, not from city council. But from the foundation and from other sources, yes, uh, we were successful uh, right off the bat um, in Richland County. And so those, the Richland, the Ontario uh, dialysis machines are, uh, have enough money, the foundation, uh, to cover those. Last month, we transferred the money that we worked on for the two Bucyrus um, dialysis machines to the hospital uh, so that at some point here, I'm not sure, uh, maybe, maybe March or April, I think, you know, they'll, they're training people right now. They're working on all the foundationary aspects of, you know, putting our own program together, um, you know, before I think they go ahead and make all the outright purchases. I hope that answered your question. Sorry. Oh, that's under. all right. Appreciate it very much. We put in 50 grand. We refresh everyone's memory. You all know that. Uh, the CARES Act, we bought that um, desanitizing mm -hmm. unit that both uh, EMS and their ER uses. Mm -hmm. And those were CARES Act dollars that right. the city put forward. I was going to ask Tom, uh, can we use ARPA money for yeah, this? Yeah, that's wide open. Okay. Yes. I, I always ask, you know. That there was a, <clears throat> I think we're all aware that there was a, there was a council member who had some specific questions. And I think, you know, probably before this gets uh, voted on, maybe to the committee decided to put it in front of council again. I want to make sure all of those uh, questions are answered. I think they're legitimate questions. They'll come back up again. Sure, 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 no problem. Can I ask one more question for clarification, please? So you're, you are a nonprofit. Yes. Are you a part of the Avita organization itself, or are you a subcontractor? No, we're not. Okay. So has the we're Avita supporting board, organization, but not profit ourselves. Okay. Has the Avita board of directors allocated any of the CARES Act dollars for the very purpose of what you're here asking us for? No. Okay. Are, or do they intend on doing that? Uh, no. I mean, in terms of uh, in terms of individual philanthropy, you know, we approach. We have 100 percent giving from all of our. Uh, Avita Health System board members mm -hmm. and our Avita Foundation board members, mm -hmm. and so again, those we ask pre predominantly for those funds to come in on an unrestricted basis, mm -hmm. um, and so as part of the million we we dispersed back to the hospital in uh, 2021, certainly uh, certainly uh, those funds were part of that, just as uh, you know those dollars that those members are contributing now. Okay. Uh, I don't know, from an unrestricted, and we do have some restricted dollars that board members give. We have some other projects we're working on as well, mm -hmm. and uh, so we have some restricted, uh, temporarily restricted gifts in there that uh, you know we're trying to you know build momentum for as well. But um, 
Okay. But, cert but certainly, mm -hmm. our the the board of the hospital, or, or the health system board, um, certainly is aware and had approved, um, you know, the strategic plan and the goals uh, for the hospital moving forward in 2022 and uh, evolving or enhancing inpatient dialysis is one of those goals. So this, this 26000 is in essence going to provide another chair, so to speak. It's going to produce, yes, another another dialysis unit, yes. And don't get me wrong, I, I'm in the industry. I, uh, I know that chair times are a struggle these days, but my last question, I promise, do you find that the primary issue is a lack of equipment or your lack of staff to okay. provide the service? It's a... Uh, it's a uh, Certainly staffing, but the, some in supplies. You know they're they're tough to come by. Mm -hmm. uh, you're we're going everywhere and anywhere <laughs> for them mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. most unusual places. Staffing's you know, but uh, staffing is uh, you know probably the most uh, critical thing that uh, that we're looking at. Well, thank um, you for entertaining my questions. I appreciate it. Okay. Anything Josh, else? Thank you so much. Thank you very Great. much. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, if there aren't any other comments or questions, I'd like to make a motion to put that resolution back on. It's a, I'm sorry, ordinance form. Okay. Okay. Last page. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to make a motion to put forth ordinance. 2022-6 in front of full council this coming Tuesday. And uh, I agree with you, Doc, but uh, even though there was some questions, I think this is going to be, those good questions going to be brought up at full council. So I will second, I, yeah, I'll second the motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. It passed unanimously. We'll move on to full council. All right. Well, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. All right. Take care. Wouldn't you like me to be back here that next Tuesday or? I'll look for a call from Julie or Natasha. We'll do. We'll cut right. uh, on the other four. We'll see where they sound out. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. And thank, thank you, sir. Nice to you. All right. You travel safe. Thank you. Drive right. safely. Thank you. Moving on to the next item is uh, we have a, a representative from the County Port Authority. I, I'm going to butcher your last name, Mark Rantola. 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 Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming. If you would like to. Uh, to Italians? Yeah. No. Oh, the same room, I'm sorry. No, no I, I'm, a, your name, your name. I'm a Finn. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, um, my, fa my, my father was from Ashtabula Harbor, and my mother was from Fairport Harbor, which, you, you know, your history, 100 years ago, the ports there had lots of uh, Finns that worked on them. And nice. Ranta actually means beach or shore. In the Finnish language, and the LA is a preposition that, so in theory, my name means beach or on the beach or on the shore. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. so, sorry for the side <laughs> no, no, Sorry, <laughs> sorry for the side lesson. <laughs> well, no, that, I, I like I love that, and I didn't mean to insult your heritage. No, you, you, you did in any way. Uh, uh, you had me engaged, Mark. I've <laughs> been binge watching Key West videos on YouTube lately. So yeah, the well, beaches in Helsinki are not. Quite as nice. Oh yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, I gave Mark a call last week just to kind of get a general idea of what general vision and goals for the Port Authority would be for 2022. I know there was uh, there's there's a lot going on, which is a great thing as far as economic development. So, if you would like to just give a summation and sure, that'd be wonderful. And stop me anytime if you got something you want to get to. The books are um, put together to. Uh, to, get, to introduce developers to Galleon as a place to potentially build housing. Um, when, the, when I came on board with the port, the priority number one, two, and three was we need to get some housing built in the community. And of the people I've talked to in the time uh, that I've been here, that still seems to be the consensus that there is a need for housing at various levels. I've met with uh, uh, three different realtors, uh, got uh, even a greater sense of the demand. Uh, the study that was done in uh, 19 by Danter for uh, not just Galleon, but Osiris and Crestline and the county uh, addressed 
fairly deep uh, dive as to the types of housing, et cetera, that existed, uh, that needed to be built. Uh, Galleon only built eight housing units in the last decade. That's kind of a incredibly low number until you get to start counting the apartments at Carter and uh, so forth. So there are, are housing that has been built since the study in 2019. Um, to kind of give you the, um, the quick version of it, basically the study says we need every type of housing category that exists, essentially from seniors and assisted living, nursing homes, all the way up to um, top end of single family residents. In between, you need um, workforce housing, you need tax credit housing. Essentially, you can fill the needs by taking parts of any of those categories. You don't have to fill uh, all of the categories at one time, but as you start to, to fill type A housing and people downsize from uh, uh, 2,500 square foot, uh, three bedroom, two bath colonial into a uh, patio home, where retirees have left the, don't want to have the stairs, don't want to carry, uh, don't want all the responsibilities of caring for a big house and moving into 1,500 or 2,000 square feet on a single floor. Uh, so there, the a goal I set out to was to identify five or six sites, and we've actually identified a couple more since I put the book together, that we can use to introduce um, builders who are looking for development sites. There are um, potential, you know, we're not looking for the Ryan homes, the people who come in and take 100 acres and build 250 homes. We, we don't have that type of demand. So we're not kind of looking for that type of developer. But if you kind of take those type of developers off the top of the, the uh, search list, I did, I identified the 20 developers who do a variety of housing types that are based within an hour to an hour and a half of Galleon. One of the most interesting items that I learned from my uh, research putting this together from the realtors is that there are a certain number of people who live in Delaware or Sunbury or on the north side of Columbus and work on the north side of Columbus who have started to look at housing in Galleon. And part of that is because some people find the school system's too big in those communities. And they'd like their kids to go in a more friendly uh, environment. Uh, some of the people who are looking for housing are nurses and doctors for Avita who have a requirement, especially those in the obstetrics category, who have to live within 30 minutes of the hospital to be on call. And then there's um, the school superintendent identified that they have, on a, in a normal year, eight to 10 teachers who are looking for apartments or houses because there's a certain group of their uh, staffing uh, in any year that are first year teachers. And uh, so they're finding a number of them have to live in Ontario because they couldn't find an apartment here 
Uh, the Carter apartments are 100% full. And hopefully we get building three and building four under construction sometime this year. Um, so there's been some progress on the, the uh, global picture of housing in Galleon since the study was done in 19. Uh, there was the, the two Carter buildings and the uh, senior housing that's currently progressing towards a, a site on Portland uh, that would create 55 plus housing. Um, so as I started uh, doing my homework, I went looking for sites that were in the 10 acre plus or minus range because you could build 25, 30, 35 housing units on a particular site depending on this type of housing you were trying to build. Um, there are a surprising number of those types of sites available in the city because of the school system strategy in creating the consolidated campus 15 years ago. You know, uh, if you go around in the book, most of the sites were once elementary, middle, or high school sites. So that gives a developer the potential on some of them of doing 40 apartments or uh, 25 patio homes or 20 single family homes, etc. So depending on the niche of the builder, I hopefully can get interested in the market, um, they'll have an opportunity to find a place to come to Galleon and build some houses. I, you know, we have in place from council the uh, CRA that could be a benefit in developing these houses. So we've, we've got a range, and I have put the books out to uh, 20 potential developers, and I'm in the process of uh, talking to, following up with them and so, and so forth. And I actually had two groups who reached out to me already based on the article that you may have seen in the Inquirer or in the Crawford County thing. So uh, that was, you know, an intentional Thing that re to reach people who might not otherwise be somebody I identify because I can't know all of the people who uh, potentially could build here. But at least we have a working group to pursue. And my hope is that we identify one or two of the sites that will maybe get under construction before the end of 2022. So that's kind of the objective that I put forward here. And uh, this, the books were created for the benefit of people who may have never been to Gallia, didn't even know what kind of community was here, didn't know what kind of businesses were here, didn't know anything about the school system. So. It's kind of a introductory uh, educational process for potential developers. Now, if you have followed the housing market even nationally, the, one of the big problems developers have is the potential sites to develop, the blanks. And so these are sites that some of them could actually be shovel ready this year because they have infrastructure, um, they have zoning, any of the combination. I mean, all of them will need some attention to make them real, but that is the goal of what I'm working on now. And by next month's board meeting, I'll probably know where we stand on uh, at least the first round of people. You may have to go back and find 20 more people. 
to do this. We, do, I, we don't know uh, what the market looks like, but I do know from experience in other places that um, developers in Delaware can't find sites to develop. And so if, they, if their product fits these sites, they may choose, hey, I can go build 20 units in Galleon and start the process. So that's kind of the objective we set. That's how we've approached it. And that's what I'm, that's my number one priority in terms of the Port Authority. Um, I have other things that the Port Authority can do. Uh, and we want to make sure that those start to advance now that we've at least stepped off on the first of these sites. Yes? Um, you mentioned other sites. Could you just name a couple of them? Yeah. Um, we, um, um, I call, I may have it misnamed, but the site on Bueller Road, uh, that okay. was. No. Uh, the old Neff Neffs. Okay. And then around the corner, there's a, a developer in the township that's interested. You know, I tend to, it may be a little bit small for some developers, but it could be workforce housing uh, and or small patio homes. You might be able to get three or four there. So, Are you yeah, referring, to the, referring to the field between, would it be Nor Road and then yeah, that road a, that Matt yeah, Valentine used to on? Yes, yeah, so on both sides of Bender. Bender. Is that yeah, the bottom of the hill kind of. Yeah, okay. that, yeah. that's, that's, that site's about four, four and a half acres. Yeah. Uh -huh. There's other farmland on the other side of the street. But it, as the mayor described it, you could potentially get a, a certain type of workforce housing there, um, smaller garden apartments. If you turn the corner, um, you've got maybe 16 or 20 housing units that are kind of no south of the church. Mm -hmm. on the North-South Street. Um, so there are some apartments in that neighborhood and it might lend itself. It might lend itself to manufactured housing. I, I don't know because we haven't explored it yet, but it, it is the size. There's an interesting manufactured housing project that was done in the last year in Crestline. And if you go north of Crestline, it, it was a um, it was a trailer park once, mm -hmm. and they they built small twelve hundred square foot manufacturing units that came together in two. But I, I don't want to criticize what they built, but they should have put garages on. <laughs> yeah, it, they would have been more valuable as units, but they used the spacing that they had on modular homes that were, or the, man, the trailer park that was there. So um, we have a site of that nature here in the city, the former trailer park potentially. You know, those are a couple of additional ones. I don't know where we're at on either of those two because I started out looking for bigger product, but they're both ones that that need to be followed up on to see what we can do to, to uh, move some of these things along. I, you know, I kind of said in the newspaper article that if we got 50 units built in the next five, not counting the senior housing, we, I think we could be all very happy that we got uh, that many units moved along because the net, the net effect is someone moves out of a three or four bedroom colonial uh, with two or three baths and they move into a patio home because they're empty nesters now. That then opens up the home they left as uh, a development, uh, as a place that uh, a family could move to. Mars, what do you define as workforce homes? I haven't heard that term before. I'm sorry. Workforce homes? Workforce. What is that? Um, I think the best description is housing that's built with tax credits that um, it's not Section 8 housing, sure. it's not public housing, 
but it's, it's places where people who have a limit that there's a limit to how much you can make and live in the apartment, but you, you, you might generate a thousand a thousand dollar a month rent that someone might not be able to get as nice a component, a nice a housing unit as this might go. It's not all that different than the 55 plus uh, senior housing that goes on. It's kind of built with tax credits that so make it happen. Are apartments or those individual single family homes? They're not single family homes. They're usually doubles, triples, um, three or four units together with garages or carports. If I could, Mayor, help me out or Mike. Yeah. Going in Middletown Road into Crestline before the tracks, there's that new subdivision. Yeah. That looks like it could be some type of, um, I'm not going to say low income housing, but they're really nice. So you have a ranch home, then you have a two story yeah. home, then a ranch home. Um, same thing in Mount Gilead. Is that what we're referring well, to? I think down to Mount Gilead, as you come and go in there, I think that that's a different, a different. Uh, yeah, that that's a, that, that's another product. Okay. Yeah. That the Mount Gilead one actually, I think, was built on a trailer park too, based on <clears throat> some things that kind of set up. And certainly across the street, there was a trailer park. Okay. And those are built on slabs, yeah. no basements. They're probably approaching 2,000 square feet. They're actually spaced a little bigger than you necessarily see in terms of lot size and so forth. Uh, but I, you know, I, I went down and looked at those and, and I actually identified the builder from there on my list of site people to send sites to. I looked at some nice things in Ashland. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the idea is to find people who are looking for places to build, and hopefully some of these will turn up. I, I mean, it, putting my old real estate hat on, I did 23 years of commercial real estate before I did economic development. I once sold a, a development site that now has 850 houses on it, it on almost 20 acres in the city of Menor. So it's it's kind of identifying the right player for a project, and that's kind of what my real estate hat tells me. Go find the guy who builds that kind of thing and convince him that he had to come build it for you. Okay. Short you. answer on work. It's a name. It's a rebranding, renaming a little bit, but it, but uh, from a zoning point of view, these units would be multifamily. Okay. Yeah. So that I think that's that with that comes a fair number of questions. Oftentimes, um, having to do with income levels. Are those ownership or, or rentals? No, those are rentals. Okay. Those those are rentals, and okay. they're made affordable by the tax credits. <laughs> that. But but not Section Eight. Not no, not at all. Okay. It's the same structure as the senior housing as far as right. how it goes. The, the, the tenants will pay less than market rent, but it, it isn't, if you will, Section 8. Okay. Yeah. But it's, it, you, you they wouldn't build it if they didn't get the tax credits. Right. And, and you, you, you probably could not live in the senior housing. You, you, you probably are above the, the thresholds of income, just as a okay. kind of understanding of, of, of what, what is there. So we'll see what happens. One other thing, if I might, sure. Mr. Chairman, I would say that uh, I believe a, a focus for uh, what I would describe as uh, single family housing that is either Manufactured, brought in on a on a couple of trailers, but I think there's a that there is. I don't want us to get caught up in developing homes in the two hundred thousand dollar range. Again, realizing like what is the, you know, who knows what the price is in this high inflation, high building material world. But I think that there's quite a bit of a market for the 
family making 55, 60,000 a year. And yeah. that we've got to um, address that. Yeah, we have to address yeah. it. And, and it, it, it should, we shouldn't shunt off those types of developments to uh, lesser parts of, of ground. I think there's focus, a market yeah. there. Yeah. Not Hopefully focus the, on, I think you profiled me, by the way. I don't know. Income, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I just, you know, we're not, there's a certain, there's a certain component, there's a certain component of out of Delaware housing market that will seem attractive to certain buyers. Just a lot of people who want to get out of Delaware, they were the ones who want to get out of Columbus. I, I just don't think we can do that. Right. I don't think there is as much market there. I, I still think. That's more onesie twosie in the Port Authority owned ground, the old Wrenchville site. But there's a lot of, um, I think, opportunity in some of the other sites that have been identified. And, and, uh, if I, could, and, I think there's opportunity for all three. I think there'll be opportunity out by NEFs for the uh, workforce homes, the ranch style homes for median to middle income or a little bit of uh, income. Families, but I also believe that we have to address executive opportunities for executive. We have so many business owners that own their businesses in town, they can't find a home in town, and they live in Lexington, Ontario, you know, out in the country. So, is there an opportunity for a third tier that would be considered? Oh, I hate to use the word executive homes, but a two hundred and three hundred thousand dollar home would be a hundred percent. Yeah. Well, um, just as background, I met with the board at Aspen Terrace today. Mm -hmm. Uh, I spent an hour and a half with 10 or 12 of them, and I'm actually meeting with them again tomorrow. Uh, they have, if I remember right, another 87 lots that can be built there, and they can be built in a variety of different sp spots there. And they had already started a process to find a builder to, to build the first 10 of this next wave. Uh, units. So, my goal, they have not, they have not been successful in identifying that building. Mm -hmm. And my goal is to help them find a builder who can build the product that they're looking for amongst what's there. The, the issue is they're pushing what the market, the high end of the market, in terms of cost of building the units for what they can sell them for. So it, it, they need to do some more homework, and I'm hoping to help them. Uh, we kind of left it today that they're going to show me some more information tomorrow that I have not seen in terms of the layouts and so forth. But their immediate goal is they have 10 sites that they can build tomorrow that require no infrastructure, the roads in, the sewers in, the, all the utilities, which makes their lots more buildable. Unlike Wrenchville, which doesn't have the infrastructure except on the street today, so there's a different timeline. But if we can identify someone to help Aspen Terrace move forward, that addresses that tier here as well. And there's actually more tiers in here. There's apartment, there's multifamily as opposed to single family in this mix too. So there's probably as many as five or six different tiers of potential housing to, to be built here. Would Aspen qualify for CRA? I mean, yeah. Uh, it, it, I, I, it, unless you excluded the condos, uh, no, no, we didn't exclude anyone. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. That's a short answer. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I did never looked at the boundaries, but I think that basically the whole city is included right. in the CRA. Right. So, there's okay. nothing, nothing there that would preclude <clears throat> them from doing it. So, um, hopefully, that gives you a sense of what we've been working on as an approach to this, as a way to hopefully address the housing needs here 
in the short term. I'm excited. I am too. Because I'm in that age group now. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> we're we're going to build your place out there right in front of Dr. Kerbs, uh, the independent senior living. Center. I don't think I qualify. <laughs> he just said it. I don't, I don't qualify yeah. by the time he gets well, Mark, I get to work. I like the idea of a, uh, I'll use the term, wide net, so to speak, to cover. Uh, yes, to focus on one thing, but to focus on a wide uh, variety for the community, I think that's a great well, approach. Well, I mean, that's kind of, the, the board didn't give me specific marching instructions. They said, just go figure out housing. But in conversations with realtors, with the, the mayor, with folks on the board, I've gotten a lot of input, but it's basically consistent with the study that came out. Yeah, and also the impression of people in town right. that this seems to be. And and one of these sites was already on the market for sale. So, I mean, that tells you that the owner of the property is prepared to make his site available. So that's that's a good thing, too. You know, and one the city owns and, and uh, there's the, uh, I never get the pronunciation right. Is it Daysville or Dow Downsville? The, the school on the southeast side. Oh, Dawson. 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 Why do I get that one? I can't get that one right. Anyway, there's a site of 11, 12 acres that might lend itself well to manufactured housing. Mm -hmm. It's a flat site. It's, you know, there's utilities on the road. That, there's lots of things there. I don't know that the owner wants to sell it, but it's there. Uh, but again, there, that's a different product than we've talked about on some of the other sites, and all of which we should explore. Um, I, mean, I don't know if council has to change anything that would allow manufactured housing to go on that site, but you know, all of those things are are reasonable things to approach if you have a developer that says, "Hey, I'll build you this, and I need your help to do this." So my job is to kind of help you get through that um, if, the, if the need comes. Awesome. Now, we also talked a little bit about other things that port authorities can do. Yes. And so I thought if we have another five minutes or something, sure. I'll share with you. Uh, this is actually a copy of an annual report we did in Lake County. But it has on, it's actually five years old, but uh, I didn't have a new one at home. But uh, I, I read to you what the, the state allows, because it's always surprising to people. The Port Authority is authorized by state law to enhance, foster, aid, provide or promote transportation projects, economic development, housing, recreation, governmental operations, culture, or research. What I, I had, Lake County had uh, 230,000 people, 11th biggest county in the state, and 23 subdivisions, townships, villages, and cities. And what I always told the, the administrations of those communities was, if you've got a project that you would like to figure, like to do, Come to me and let me explore what resources might be available for something. Um, I think it's one of those things that, because people don't see, they think about port authorities in terms of financing of, of large scale industrial projects, but they don't realize all these other things. One of my great pride and joy in my career was we built a Miracle League field in Eastlake next to the Captain's Minor League Park. And a Miracle League field is a special needs playground, a uh, special needs baseball uh, site that's built with a certain type of surface because 90% of kids with special needs have an allergy to a, uh, latex. 
So they, you build it with this, and you can run scooters, uh, uh, wheelchairs, uh, all these things on the, on the playground, on the field. And then we built a, a uh, special needs playground. I mean, the whole project was a million three. I mean, it's, this is not a little project, but we had uh, 10 or 12 teams the first year with kids playing. And then one of the great pieces of it is every kid has a buddy next to him. So when you're a parent sitting in the stands watching your kid play who's never been able to play baseball in any form or shape, you look out and there's 15 buddies standing next to each one of them wearing a yellow shirt and helping all of the kids. And uh, truly, you know, that's a, we got it done kind of through Port Authority functioning, but we got money from the state, 200 from the state capital budget. We got money from Lake Health, uh, the hospital, from Lou Brazaw, and uh, a little bit of CBG money and stuff. But we put it all together. By the time we built it, we had had paid for it. And uh, the, an engineering firm put all their young engineers on the design, and they all got to work on it, which was a thrill for them because they usually design culverts. And <laughs> when you, you know, when you come when you come out of college and you start in a mechanical or uh, engineering firm, um, you probably saw a lot of those young guys designing culverts when you were doing highways. I would, I would guess. So, so anyway, the the point is, I want you to know that if you think of something, if you're driving. You know, I I thought of the. Miracle League field because I heard an NPR story about one that was opening in uh, Finley, Ohio. And I drove over to Finley. I said, I came back. I said, we're going to do this. <clears throat> but the point is that there's a whole realm of possible projects that, that, you know, not all of them are financeable. Not all of them can make happen. But it, we do have the ability to buy and sell land to do things that are easier for us to do than council can do. Because, you know, council disposing of property uh, has to public bid. You can transfer it to the Port Authority and we can use it in negotiation with a uh, developer to make a project possible. So they're, they're you know, I'm, I'm really happy that I had a chance to come both well, talk to you about the housing, but also share with you some of the other things that we can do in any time you need me to come in and talk. Uh, you know, I'm here to do that. I, I, uh, the Port Authority operated uh, Lost Nation Airport, which had two runways and 100 based aircraft. You know, uh, so I, I have a little experience with FAA, with the Army Corps of Engineers, because we had 31 miles of lakefront. And we were dealing with channels and all those types of things. So things that you might not have thought about, if there's something here that we can help, that's what we're here to do. That's awesome. All right. That's great. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Mary, have anything you want to say? No? I just want us to focus as to the extent that you can on projects that the city has already invested either money or traded property. So we've talked about that before. One, yeah. of the, one of the unrealized goals is to develop additional property to the Valero and the uh, Sleepin. So we need to make that a, a yeah. sort of a targeted area. Um, and it's already on my list. Yeah, right, I understand. So I, I you ask if I had any, I would say to have the properties Wrenchville, uh, the old Eagle Crusher site for two. Uh, the other, we don't need to write it this way. Anyways, so yeah. I think I heard what you said, but okay. I'll just stop. No, I mean, I was yeah. just, I'm glad you brought that up because our next topic of discussion, yeah. letter B, is the status in revisiting the infrastructure out on State Route 598 and 30. Yeah, I, and I, I, I couldn't came. agree with the mayor more um, about opportunities out there behind the or beside the hotel and or the Valera gas station. And we have received grant money and we have already invested some money from those grants and just uh, you know through you know clearing out some land and 
bringing behind there and things like that? Do you have right. any yeah. goals or visions for that area out there? Yeah. Uh, a backup to Eagle Crusher, that's the trail site. No, no, he, that, no. Yeah, he, is it? No, that's Oh, the, no, that's the other one. That's yeah. the south end. No, oh, yeah. What's, the, what's, what was the name? South Market. What was the name of the trail site? Uh, that used to be Levant's Junkyard. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I knew it had oh, a name that we, yeah. we wanted a, a more marketable name. That's why it's right. the trail site. <laughs> the old Junkyard site. Yeah, okay. And it inspires <laughs> investment. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, that's kind of... Uh, I want to focus in on that because there's a lot of property. The stuff that we've already got city money invested in, in even if it's small investments, I think we want to try to make those top of the list uh, priorities within uh, the, you know, the discussion that's already. Yeah, um, actually, um, when, I, when I went to the hotel tonight, I was looking at Grant on the west side of Brant where the field was, yeah. uh, which was not really city investment that's there. But if we could get someone to develop on that side of the street, west of the hotel, yeah, yes. that would be kind of leveraging the effort that's been put in place already. So that's kind of on my list, as well as the sites north of the sleep. I believe that there is potential I, in my real estate career, I did 80 restaurant deals. Plus, I worked for TGI Fridays and opened up 36 of those in my career. So I have a lot of restaurant experience that I'm going to try to leverage into uh, a chain restaurant or two to go to that north site. Because I think we have opportunity not to diminish any of the people who are here doing business, but I think that there's potential for certain types of restaurants that might benefit by being on a freeway interchange um, that could go there as well. Okay. That'll give you 780, almost 800,000 reasons to make that a top priority. Yeah, it is. Which is the amount of money that we put into the Keller Road extension and storm utilities. So, you know, so I think that's that's something we've really got to focus on is getting other pop-up development that warrants that investment, A, and then on the on topic B, we've got to come up with a way to start to pay down that um, that roadway investment. I know there's focus on the new roadway and filling the part that we didn't get in 629, but we don't have what we've done simply since <clears throat> Cal Road Extension was put in, the access point onto Valero, we've rolled the debt. Mm -hmm. We're not paying down any debt there, folks. So we've got to come up with a plan that enables us to pay that down. Uh, and, and that's part of, of letter B. Anyway, they all do come together. Yeah. And we, we've got to get the pieces, uh, begin to put them in place. Well, I'm, now that we've got the housing mm -hmm. pretty much identified, mm -hmm. that is the next, I, uh, the next site, and then 61, mm -hmm. um, doing the, the groundwork to make things happen on both of those, <coughs> both of those sites. So that's kind of where, where I'm headed on that on those types of, of projects. Uh, to give you an update, um, I was talking uh, with uh, Gary earlier and he told me that the, the project that Bridgeford and Mays is going yeah, to do. Right. Yeah, yeah. That they, ha they have ordered the steel right. for that delivery is September September time frame. Uh, it would build the first 50,000 square feet of that spec building. But it has room to be expanded to 112,000. Uh, the good news is the steel is ordered. The bad news is it's not coming until September. Everything's on back order right now. It seems yeah, like yeah, the whole world. But at least uh, it was 
good good news to report that the steel has been ordered. Yeah. Okay. Well, that has to get handed off. Aaron, I'm just get jump on the agenda. That's got to get handed off effectively in a detailed way. So I, we'll get into partnership discussion, but there's some specific things that the city, again, has an investment in that it's in our interest to make sure there's a there's a, a clear handoff. Mm -hmm. And so I mentioned that at the court meeting last week. Right. Well, I, it needs to be effective. The, yep. the, the person who is uh, really uh, been at the forefront of that project is going to leave, and um, again, there's a, there's every need to make sure that project gets moved. You know, from delivery of steel to I, I actually think, and I'll make it quick. I actually think that that building can be pre-sold if we do the right communication in that handoff with Jobs Ohio, and make sure we begin to right. Be sure that that building is submitted every time a building, and those are things that I think are detailed. But in in the replacement of somebody in that position, um, we have to make sure that our projects don't slip through the cracks. So I think I mean I don't want to get long-winded or ahead of it, but I think that that's another role the fort's going to need to step up and play. Yeah, Gary and I spent uh, an hour and a half this morning. That's no, really good. That's go, very important. Go, yeah. Going through, starting to go through the list of to dos. Uh, good. Other things. That's, and, that's and the other good. part is, he's still expecting to remain as a court board member, where we'll have him as a a resource to answer questions on those types of things. Yeah, I, I all of that's good news. All right, Mark, thank you very much. Did you want to stick around for our next discussion topic of the Crawford Partnership? Is that relevant to the world? Well, I'm certain, I, I have no place to go except back to the, <laughs> except go back to the hotel because I have a couple meetings tomorrow here. So well, like the mayor I, just alluded to, your role at the Port Authority is probably going to inter, interchange quite a bit with the Crawford Partnership over there in one way or another, so I would, it might be beneficial. I would expect so, and I'm more than happy to stay and be part of that discussion. I'm not looking to run out the door. All right, wonderful. All right. Uh, Mayor, why don't you go ahead and... Helen B, let me fill in. Oh. We right. have appropriated money. I think it's... I'm going to get the top one. I think it's 521. There was money, cash, advanced last year into that fund so that we could reimburse a contractor if the um, extension back to the free center was built. That's the roadway. Mm -hmm. So that's in the budget. There's enough for that 469 that came from the apartment development and then 75 that came from jobs and commerce, which I think is Jobs Ohio. No, that's that's an ODAP. Okay, that's ODAP. That's an ODAP program. Yeah, every, you're right. Okay, so uh, that money, the cash is there. The local share, which is 150,000, is, and I don't make light of this, but kind of a multiple choice of projects that we need to fund out of this year's paving and construction budget. Okay. The water and sewer, which in last year's budget was, uh, we were pledging the city's permanent improvement fund to pay those portions. That's not funded that way in this year's budget. So that has, um, that was a judgment made, and I'll own it, I guess, that that there weren't going to be four votes to allow the service director to let those projects. Maybe that was presumptuous on my part. Can you clarify, you talk about the $300,000 capital improvement from the sale of the Mosley building that we, is that what you're referring yeah. to? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's about, it's, I think there's 400 and some thousand. We've got a, the last installment coming next year. In last year's budget, mm -hmm. count, that council agreed, and you remember it was a 4-3 right. vote, agreed to go ahead and fund the water and sewer portion of that. Mm -hmm. okay. That's not how the budget is this year. Right. So as we move ahead and, it, and we clarify whether or not we're going to build that infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, we've got to remember that we have to come up with a way to fund that water uh, and sewer. Last thing I'd say about that, it doesn't make any sense at all uh, to build the roadway and then later on decide whether we want the sewer or not. When you look at the, the design that was roughed out and we hope to have, ironically, we're going to have shelf plants, but it, you have to build the water and sewer, roadway, storm sewer, pretty much all at the same time. So that would, that's <clears throat> status or revisiting the infrastructure at 598 and 30. That's, that's a bad news for two-thirds of this committee and, and a, like not good news, but the people who don't want to see that built, it, it probably doesn't get built the way the budget was passed. Question. If yeah. it does not get built, then, and forgive me for asking out of the yeah. ignorance, doesn't that make your job much more difficult to recruit any new businesses out in that area? It doesn't have to be a recreation center. 